It's Behind the Hype. With me, your host, as always, Brian Dressel. With me this week is Chewy Darso. Hello. Jonathan Hardesty. Woo. And special guest, Brock Holiday. Yay. Oh, my God. I hate doing that voice so much. <laughs> it's like, Bad least... news, bro. You're going to do it every week now. Ah, <laughs> I, I have one more week that I have to do it, and then I can put it to bed and never do it again. Which... Now, we're just going to repeat SNL movies every month now. That's we're going to run podcast. out of them real fucking yeah, fast. Not very many. <laughs> um, well, if you stick to the rigid rules that we did, where if the SNL movie had to originate from an SNL sketch, there's very few. But they've actually produced way more than that. Huh. Um, but I was, I was very me about it. I like to stick to the rules, the very specific <laughs> rules. Oh boy. Okay, so week three uh, of our, I was very sure that this month was going to be a little rough on movies, but so far we're three for three on good ones. Uh, we got Wayne's World this week. Hooray! Yay. Hooray! Hooray! Woohoo! Excellent. <laughs> my, my number two all-time movie, I think. Number two, like not just comedy, all time, like just any just, movie. Uh, okay, not that I think is necessarily good, but what makes me feel uh, happy and brings me in joy. Uh, wow. It's definitely probably number two. What's number one? Jurassic Park. Fair enough. Oh, well, you had a good like back to back movies. Like ninety two, great. Ninety three, great. After that, yep. stop. <laughs> <laughs> haven't seen a movie since <laughs> uh so for those of you who are not familiar with that voice you've never been on one uh, on behind the hype correct uh was the mike myers halloween three uh behind that oh that, that was still... okay yeah, yeah yeah i forgot that one yeah. um we've done don't a we lot all of <laughs> we've, yep. we, we, we've done a lot um but welcome back you've never been on behind the hype you're on after the hype mm-hmm. before we switch brands i don't think we've even had a guest since we've rebranded have we no this feels really weird actually yeah it's a it's a little strange like a new it, pair of underwear you know at first it's rest- <laughs> restrictive or constrictive and then it becomes part of you yeah i guess we'll see at the end of the episode if brock has become part of us or not i'm horrified by john's underwear <laughs> becomes part of him are you, you just missing the the reference to today's movie yes <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure before you're just i mean i would also be very horrified by john's underwear in general it doesn't have to be part of him i just don't want to see john's underwear it's just not something i need in my life no offense john thanks but, but your underwear can take all of the offense it was specifically okay, yeah, directed sure. at your underwear <laughs> you can dream about his underwear tonight i uh thanks uh, not you, John. <laughs> Just your underwear. <laughs> no, this is gonna be. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna open your your dresser drawer. And it's gonna be filled with all this underwear. And you're like, I can't wear any of this. It's all John's. I don't. <laughs> John took all my underwear. <laughs> I don't have all of John's underwear. I didn't even want to see this. <laughs> well, where's my underwear? Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm like, where's my underwear? Where did John's go? up in Santa Clarita going? None of this underwear fits. <laughs> Somebody way bigger than me has replaced all of my underwear with their underwear. Okay. <laughs> this gag is done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, <laughs> let's move into a where have they been doing. Uh, I, I realized very quickly that if you wanted to watch a full episode like we did for Coneheads uh, of any of these seasons of SNL, it's very fucking difficult. Yep. Uh, you either have to own them, own one of the like the VHSs or DVDs, or you're just not fucking doing it. Um, I went to like multiple different legal sources, couldn't find it anywhere. So, oh well, we just watched a bunch of Wayne's World sketches. I, uh, John, do you have time for any where have they been doings? Unfortunately, no. Uh, that was the goal, but then I got pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. The sketches, uh, it's just kind of um, they're funny. Like they're just well made, comedically timed. Like these two guys are funny. Um, it's interesting when you read about how like uh. Mike Myers came up with the character for Wayne like way before he was even on SNL. Like this was like a second city thing. And when he came to SNL, he didn't want Dana Carvey near it. It was supposed to be Wayne's world. It's just about Wayne. He didn't want a right hand man. And then they brought in Dana Carvey, who's arguably the bigger star at the time. And, and then this thing became what it is now. Um, they flipped. Yeah, they they kind of did. Um, <laughs> that fucking Dana Carvey show, man. Just destroyed his career although it was very funny um but yeah so when we're watching the sketches like it it's it's funny how well the jokes all still work everything's still funny like they're just all well made like they're just good 
they're entertaining. It's not like uh, Coneheads where you're like, eh, this one kind of overstated its welcome, or this one you can kind of see where the movie came from. But yeah, like the when you take the sketches and then you look at the movie, it's like, oh, I can see where this came from because the movie does, uh, and we'll get into it when we start the movie here in a second. Um, it does a good way to kind of bridge you from I've only seen this in sketches and now I'm going to see it in a movie form. Um, but if you've only only seen the sketches, you're not going to feel like you're lost in the movie. And if you've never seen a single sketch, you're not going to be lost in the movie. So I like that they're they're both kind of independent, but also very much the same. What did you think of them? You watched all of them with me. I mean, I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the movie more. Sure. I mean, like, a lot of times when I watch the sketches for Wayne's World, I'm like, this is amusing, but, like, it makes me think of Beavis and Butthead at the same time. I can kind of see that. I mean, they, they did kind of come out at the same time, and they have a very similar take on how to, like, comment on pop culture. Adolescence. Yeah. Um, uh, Gen X. If I had to hang out with somebody, I would definitely rather hang out with Wayne and Garth. Oh, yeah. They're just kind of nice guys. They're yeah. just goofballs. All right, well, if that's it for where have they been doing, let's just dive right into this thing. Uh, Brock, before we get started uh, going too far down the road with this one, since this is your number two all-time make-me-feel-happy movie. Ooh, that's a bad branding. Uh, (laughs) uh, Do you want to give us a quick breakdown of what happens in this movie? Uh, Yeah. Um, I just want to point out real quick before I do that, I don't know how I got this movie when I was a kid. I, I, I think I was... Four or five, I'm like guessing when it came out. VHS, <laughs> right? And like we just had like hundreds of VHSs. I don't know why my it wasn't a movie my parents would have watched or cared about. I don't know how I got it. So it, it kind of it blows my mind that it's. It, I even found it, but um, yeah. So the movie kind of just starts out with the kind of the sketch with in their basement during the show, and. Um, Kind of gets a glimpse in their life with the most. Did you, okay, sorry, I don't mean to sidetrack again. But did you guys do the uh, Bohemian Rhapsody thing when you turned sixteen and got a car? I'm not sure if I did it right when I was sixteen, but I definitely did it at some point. That that was our uh, number number one goal when when all my friends and I turned sixteen, and <laughs> it was not as cool as we thought it would be. <laughs> well, no, you don't. I have... don't recommend actually driving and doing that. It's a pain in the neck, I'll tell you what. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. is it. It would almost ruin your entire uh, your entire month and a half of shooting because you'd hurt your neck so much. And then throughout random scenes throughout your movie, you'd have awkward, very stiff moments where you kind of look like Michael Keaton in the bat suit looking at each other like, what? You know, I never really <laughs> realized that, that w- they were immobilized. I just thought that was them being extra awkward. Nope, that's them with injured necks because they shot that scene first. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, Brock, really? continue. Ma- <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that makes uh, me feel better about how I've never liked headbanging because I always thought it hurt. It does. Uh, eventually, they get offered a deal to take Wayne's World uh, mainstream by Rob Lowe, and he has a sinister plot behind it, and eventually, friendship wins out, and that's kind of my synopsis of the movie. Yeah, that kind of works. Um, so kind of starting at the, the beginning of this thing, and then we'll just kind of move through it. Uh, I gotta say, I, I mentioned a little bit before we started talking during the where they've been doing, but I, I think this movie, out of uh, out of the three SNL sketches that we've watched... Or, SNL movies based on sketches that we've watched so far. I think this one handles the transition from sketch to movie the best. Um, because Blues Brothers is just not really a lot there, sketch wise. It's mostly a musical act. Um, and then Coneheads was such a long time separated from its sketches to when the movie came out, because it came out after this one. Um, right? Uh, yes. Let's see. Yes. Yes. Um, so, like, there was just a lot more distance, so they didn't really have as much to rely on. Whereas this one kind of came out, like, right in step with it. And it kind of has this whole, like, I need to let you know that you are watching Wayne's World. And that's the entire opening. It feels like a, a scene right out of SNL. If the the um, hair suck cut guy, if he was an SNL alum, it'd be like, yeah, this just feels like an SNL sketch. It feels very comfortable. It's what we've been watching every week, every Saturday night. Um, and then it's just kind of done. And then the movie starts. And I just love the way that it just kind of acknowledges where it's coming from. And then never really returns to it. Like, we never see a full episode mm-hmm. of Wayne's World beyond that first one throughout the entire movie. We might see bits and pieces, especially, like, when they're, like, doing the, the blue screen test. Um, or for the few <laughs> seconds that Garth is left alone on screen by himself. But we never really see, like, a full take except for that first one. 
It's true. Yeah, which I think is a really kind of nice way to intro us into the movie and kind of bring us up to speed of like, this is who we are, and this is where we're going now to be. Now we're actually in Rain's, Wayne's world. Yeah. yeah. If before you're just watching his TV show, now you're just kind of, now you get both. You get a little bit of TV show, but now you get to see actually Wayne's world. Yeah. But, and they break the fourth wall to let you know that he's bringing you into his world. Oh, yeah. And like, they don't break the wall in like the, uh, say like the, eh, I guess it's kind of the Deadpool way. Like, they don't acknowledge it like a camera or a film crew. They're acknowledging you, the audience. Like, whoever's watching the movie, that's who Wayne is talking to. He's not talking to, like, yeah. a crew. He's not talking to his assistant. He's not talking to himself. He's talking to you, the viewer. And I kind of like that. It's kind of a fun way to, like, it makes the movie a little bit more personal. And by keeping that, like, almost, like, arm's distance, it lets them do whatever the fuck they want in the movie. And it can be this absurd piece of cinema that we all really, really like. If not love. The, like the room full of stuck guys training. Yes. <laughs> like things like that. Like if they didn't have this, I mean, I'm sure they could, but that fourth wall breaking really makes those sorts of jokes work that much better. Was there a lot of movies that kind of tried that trick up to this point? Cause I, mean, I haven't, I'm not as well versed with movies, but I don't really remember anything trying it quite to the degree that Wayne's world did. I mean, they might be out there, but they're certainly not as popular as Wayne's World. Like, they're not even sticking around in my head. But Yeah, I couldn't say anything about what occurred before this one that did that. Because many tried to replicate it after this one. Yeah. Well, I, I think yeah, the only no, one that I could think of that did it before, at least to this extent, would be Ferris Bueller. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Which then they brought into Deadpool. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even still, this has its own unique flavor. And I, I think out of the movies we listed that aren't Wayne's World, this breaking of the fourth wall remains my favorite to this day. Nothing has, to me, quite matched just the friendliness of it and the, like, yeah, man, you're with me. You're kind of hanging out. We're, we're buds with yeah. the audience. Like, I, I love that vibe more so than any other version I've seen in movies. So you haven't seen Spice World, where they compliment your clothing at the end of the movie? Okay, that's one moment in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> An underrated piece of cinema, by the way. <laughs> I've never sat through the entirety of Spice World. What? Oh, God, I, oh. I took, I had the movie, I had a poster. I love that movie. Spice World's great. I'm not taking anything away from either one of you. I've just never <laughs> seen it. Uh, <laughs> no, but I agree with what kind of what John was saying. Like there, there is a friendliness to Mike Myers. Like there is something that, like when you watch, say Ferris Bueller, it's some guy. He, He's kind of talking down to you the whole time. Like, hey, man, you need to be like me. You need to be as cool as me. And you get the same I got thing. this figured out, man. Yeah. I got this figured And you get the same sort of thing from Deadpool. Like, Deadpool's the same. Like, hey, look at me. Like, oh, we're in on the joke. Like, but Deadpool's a lot more meta. It's more like, hey, we all know this is a movie. We all know this is based on X-Men, but we can't use any of the X-Men. Like, they just kind of lean into it. So Deadpool's ex- hysterical in his own way. But this one, it's just far more. It's exactly how John said it. It's just a couple of buddies. They're just hanging out. Yeah. Although... You're not allowed to talk to anyone else, which they make very clear when Ed O'Neill tries to talk to you. It's like, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. Dude, but I it even ha- but it even has its own arc too, where like when he yells at the camera, when he yells at you, you turn away. Like we turn away, and he's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, man." Like there, there's like a little mini arc in this movie with us and Wayne. Yeah, we, our friendship grows throughout the movie. But I want to know the history of the other guy's his anger of Ed O'Neill's know, anger. I want to know where it came from. <laughs> Oh, his speech I is know like a that classic. So much. Ed O'Neill fucking just cracks me up. Yeah, it's so good. And this was like right at the beginning of when did they start Married with Children? Was it would have been before early? this. What did it? Yeah, because this is ninety two. So I that... think Married with Children was like eighty eight. I want to really? say. Yeah, it was got Fox going. Eighty seven. Eighty seven. Wow. That's close. Um. But yeah, like the the just conversational nature. Uh, it extends a little bit to Garth, but Garth doesn't really talk to the camera all that much. No. It's mostly what, just, like, he does during the contract scene and a few bits here and there, but it's mostly Wayne's show. Right, I, and and he even struggles with it uh, at the penthouse when he's like, hey, come, come, hey, come with me. <laughs> Rib for her pleasure. Ew. Like, he, he's he's not quite used to this relationship that, like, Wayne is. So it was quite a, a, a nice twist, which also adds to why the fourth wall breaking here is my favorite. Oh, yeah. Like, the fact that, like, it, it is just clearly that we are a character in the movie in its own way that is to be ignored, <laughs> um, unless you're Wayne or Garth. <laughs> and the fact that Garth has a little bit of trouble with us. It's like it, it kind of puts in its own backstory in a way of, like, 
oh, Wayne and I, we go way back. We just met Garth, though. Like, we're still feeling each other out. <laughs> but beyond that, like, you just gotta... Whenever you sit down to watch this movie, like, beyond the fact that you can sit there and quote it, probably, uh, if you're in your 30s, like most of us, uh, yep. you can probably sit there and just quote the whole thing front to back. Uh, won't even need subtitles. But there's something to be said about just kind of how how amazing that is. Like, there's plenty of comedies out there that I think are probably funnier than Wayne's World, uh, but there, there's just something about that quotability that just makes it a little bit more personal. Like, we kind of, it feels like it's part of us in a way because it's just so in our heads. Like, we know it, like the verbiage. If I were to say to any one of my friends, basically, uh, just any part of the quote of, like, a gun rack. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I, it, everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about and they can usually finish the quote for me. Like there's oh, something yeah. just and, and super special and awesome about that. Yeah, and it's perfect too because there's also a forgiveness in goofing up the quotes that doesn't exist in any other movie. So if I'm quoting something to you and I make a mistake with this movie in terms of the quote, you don't hear the mistake. You hear the full quote and we all laugh and have fun together rem- reminiscing about the movie, which is for me has been a unique kind of phenomenon with this movie versus others. It's like everyone wants to enjoy remembering that quote so they don't get wrapped up in like, well, you said it wrong. Oh, yeah. And, like, you just kind of get excited, especially just out of nowhere. Like, if you just randomly bust out, uh, say... So anytime I get a gift, I say if it's a severed head, I'll be very, I'll be very upset. <laughs> uh, no one gets it anymore, but it's always funny to me. I mean, that one's a little bit more obscure, but I think I'd still understand it if you were to say it. Or I'd probably go, fuck, what's that from? I know that. I know that. Yeah. I'd do one of those things. I have said that line to my kids a few times, and when they're like, here, try, here's the surprise for you. I'm like, if it's a severed head, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> and they don't get it. If they did, well, I guess your your oldest might be old enough for this. I definitely would have seen it by the time I was her age. Yeah, yeah, probably. But yeah, she hasn't yet, and probably wouldn't get the joke just yet. Yeah. We'll try it on her later. Yeah. Have her watch the movie. Yeah, see how well that goes. <laughs> yeah, after this, I'll wake her up and make her yeah. watch it. Yeah, do it. Yeah, see if she'll be like me when I was a kid watching this, and they say, I'll have the cream of some young guy, and everyone starts laughing. I'm like, why are they laughing? He's just ordering dinner. <laughs> yeah, I don't the, get it. Why the, is my, the rib for her my... pleasure one, too. I was like, I don't know what that means. Like, why does she need that? Yeah, I like, like ribs. <laughs> <laughs> why is that gross? Ribs are good. It's weird that he has them in his underwear drawer. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I remember I remember watching this movie with my parents, and as soon as Wayne goes, "All the cream of some young guy," <laughs> my parents just both like spit take laughing, and I'm like, "What was funny? What did I miss?" And I was just like, "No, no, 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 no." I also didn't know what sphincter was back then. A sphincter says what? What? <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't get that either. What sphincter? Oh, it's a. Oh, I also didn't know what blowing goats would mean either when I was little. Yep, nope. He has it on the card. <laughs> this, this man, man blows goats. I, I have, have proof. proof. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, this is a funny movie. Um, it's just charming. It, like I know we've kind of touched that a little bit, but like uh, Mike Myers does a great job. Dana Carvey's, you know, adorable in the role. It just, it just makes you feel. It's just so happy. It's, it makes me feel good. Yeah, and it's it's one of those movies where like the the it's more than the sum of its parts and it's almost kind of amazing that it got here. Like you look at this is the film debut of Mike Myers. First time he's ever in a movie is Wayne's World. First time Chris Farley was ever in a movie as a security guard. Um but the fact that this is his first movie ever, he was filming it while his dad was sick and dying. Um like just that those few things alone makes it like how did he pull off this amazing performance and he's working with a director who at the whole time he didn't get along with like he didn't get along with the director his dad was sick his first movie uh he had multiple jobs because he had to write it and he had a star in it like mike myers was pushed to the brink and man did he show up to play he's got a good work ethic yeah and he's so like you just look at mike myers in anything and he's just so devoted to any character he's in like, the man workshopped the fucking love guru for a year in New York clubs before he made that movie. He mm. probably should have workshopped it a little longer. Yeah. But... <laughs> maybe outside of New York. Yeah, maybe outside of New York. Uh, I, I'm not sure what else he could have done with that one. But still, like, I'm just saying, like, the dedication the guy has to his roles is just beyond impressive. 
And I think if it wasn't for that, who knows if this movie would have been as good. I mean, yes, you have Dana Carvey, who's one of the funniest people ever, but like, it's called Wayne's World for a reason. Right. And you said it earlier, Brian, uh, the, so- like, the parts all added together just works perfectly. It's like that, that um, you know, perfect batch of pancakes. You get the right amount of flour and sugar and all that in there, and they just poof. It's amazing. Yeah, th- this is just one of those. It's kind of like uh, we go back to Blues Brothers. Like Coneheads felt like more like a uh, a plan that was executed, whereas like this one in Blues Brothers, it feels more like, oh, fuck, I hope it works. Hey, it did. Like this is, uh, a, I think it's still to date the only SNL movie that's grossed over a hundred million dollars. Like this uh, movie, Blues was, Brothers. Blues Brothers did it too. Yeah. Um, yeah, like this movie is just a fucking hit. I. Uh, but there are other things in this movie beyond just Wayne and Garth, and I feel like we should talk a little bit about them, uh, including this was considered the resurgence of his career for Rob Lowe and his first comedic role, which he has then used throughout the majority of his career past this, has been in tons yep. of comedies. But he was coming off of a big sex tape scandal before he was in this thing, and people were a little iffy on Rob Lowe. And then he was in this, and he's fucking hysterical. Because everyone remembered Rob Lowe's talented and attractive. Talented, attractive, can play the straight funny man very well. Well, that's what they were, he was saying in, uh, you know, wiki information is that this movie he credits with realizing that he can be comedic. Oh, yeah. He, he didn't really have comedic chops before this or was allowed to stretch them. Yeah, I mean, if he, I don't I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with his career before this. But, I mean, after this, when I think of Rob Lowe, I usually think of a funny guy. Yeah. Because he's usually funny. You look at Parks and I mean, Rec. I, I like to think about how many Lowe's Rob Lowe could rob. <laughs> Rob Lowe robbed Lowe's. You broke my brain. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. <laughs> 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 I just love that joke. Well, shut her down. It's all It's all over. Yeah, no, I, just, I need to take a minute. My brain needs to repair itself. It's chewy of- just, I've heard that joke so many times, but you just worked it into conversation. And a very casual... just. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was always <laughs> curious about how many lows Rob Lowe would rob if Rob Lowe robbed Lowe's. Uh, <laughs> that's what she, that's what keeps her up at night. <laughs> she definitely swept the leg with her. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry. Who else was in this movie? Well, Tia. Okay, so we can talk about the director a little bit. I mean, one, it's a female director, which a lot of people probably don't think about. No, and she was not invited back for the sequel. Because uh, of how much she was fighting with... Uh, Mike Myers, Mike yeah. Myers. And from the sound of it, they needed each other to bounce off each other to make the quirky, fun movie that everyone loved. Because Wayne's World 2 is not remembered as fondly. No, I mean, Wayne's World 2 is much more unfiltered Mike Myers. Yeah. Like, you look at Wayne's World 2, and you can make the leap to Austin Powers like that. Like, yeah. it's just like, oh, yeah, I see where this came from. But this one is far more restrained. Yeah, so this is, just kind of, to me, it's kind of an example of, yeah, you're good by yourself, but you're better with someone who can edit you a little bit. Kind of like George Lucas. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, we... There's good stuff in the prequels, but the other ones were much better when, like, you had your wife and other people editing your stuff. <laughs> if if somebody had uh, worked on those scripts other than George Lucas, the prequels would have been amazing. Yeah. And, and yep. it's kind of like the yeah. same thing here. Like, I don't think Wayne's World 2 is a bad movie, but I, I don't really ever, like, reach out for it. Like, if but, it was on, like, if I still had cable and it was on, I'd watch it, but I don't have cable, so it's not on, so I don't watch it. But you right, right. And it's, not, and it's not one of those movies where, like, whenever I think of, like, uh, a Wayne's World moment, I'm always thinking of a Wayne's World 1 moment. There's yeah. really any. There's never any time where I'm thinking of a moment like, "Oh, oops, that was in two. Like there was the uh, Terminator gag in this, and I was like, "Oh man, I, I I hope that's in this one." And sure enough, it was. Like any time I've ever been like, "Oh, I hope it's in this one." It is. <laughs> two Which, doesn't have any of that. No, I think two has has the assless chaps Indian, and it has uh, the Jurassic Park moment. And otherwise, I don't really remember a lot of two. Yeah. There's but the I, Drew Barrymore like Jorgen Fjorgen from Bjorgen thing oh, that. Right. I, I'll quote that every now and then, but very rare, once in a blue moon. Yeah. And it, But just for the director, looking at her IMDb history before this movie... And it's uh, Penelope Sarah Sefries, I believe her last name is? Spheris, I think? I have to look at it. Oh, uh, what is it? The pronunciation. Spheris, I think? Spheris? S-P-H-E-E-R. She worked with Megadeth a whole bunch before this movie. 
She did a lot of their video shorts. She did documentaries. Uh, two different things called The Decline of Western Civilization. Uh, and she did a documentary called Thunder and Mud, and that thing just looks nuts. So, like, she definitely looks like a woman who understood metal music and how to channel bro stuff. Judging by the the titles of her previous properties. Yeah, you you look at her uh, her history, and it's like I could see why they asked her to do Wayne's World. Yeah, like totally. Uh, it's a real shame that she and Mike Myers just didn't get along, and I, I really hope that it's just because they didn't get along, and it wasn't like something else behind the scenes. But it also makes me more surprised that uh, Cassandra's band in the movie doesn't. I wouldn't say sounds very metal. Yeah, none of the music that they describe is like like when they talk about going to the gas works. It's like, yeah, it's perfect heavy metal bar. I'm like, this isn't really heavy metal though. No, I mean, I mean honestly, when I think of Queen, I don't really think of them as heavy metal either. No, they're a hair band. Yeah, yeah well, just, they're glam. I consider them glam rock more. Either but... way, who cares what Queen is? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like Tia Carrari? Car- I've never been able to pronounce her last name. Cassandra. Relic Hunter. <laughs> Uh, did her own <laughs> singing during this entire film, and she was on the soundtrack. She can and wail. She's freaking talented. She can, she can wail. Like she is so much better than the stupid Steven Seagal movies that she makes today. <laughs> uh, no, she's recorded my favorite version of Ballroom Blitz. Yeah. If I have to really listen to Ballroom good. Blitz, I'd rather listen to her version than anybody else's. It's great. I wish she had that. been actually cast as uh, Tomb Raider in this in the latest movies instead of. She might be a little old for it now. Yeah, she could do it. She could be old Laura Croft. <laughs> sure. Um, but she got a show, Relic Hunter, that was still just as fun. I never watched Relic Hunter. I did, Hunter but I was dorkier than you back then. That's so. different type of dorks. <laughs> um, there are a lot of kind of interesting things like behind the scenes in this movie. Like When you just think about things that Mike Myers was so sure wasn't going to work. Like, he thought for sure there's no way people would la- love or laugh at the Bohemian Rhapsody scene. He's like, nah, this won't work. I don't want to do it anymore. My neck hurts. I don't want to, like, this isn't fun. <laughs> and Penelope's like, no, you're going to do it. <laughs> and everyone's going to love it. Penelope. 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 I'm so- Penelope. I say Penelope. <laughs> what? Ever since Club Dread, you say Penelope every time. <laughs> then I said Penelope. Penelope. Close enough. Penelope. Club Dread? It's still, Yes. Barely even remember that you had me watch that movie. Yeah, it ruined Penelope for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's Penelope. <laughs> also, the fact I don't like the name Penelope. Well, then there you go. Um, but there was that scene, and then like Mike Myers was convinced that the Terminator Two scene wasn't going to play. Like he just had so many uh, these ideas that he's like, "Nah, this isn't going to work." And this is why it was so good to have a director with him that was willing to fight him on stuff because she was right. Like she fought to keep the Bohemian Rap scene. She fought to keep the 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 Terminator scene. Like she was right. Like th- this stuff, it is funny. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mike Myers still wrote it. Like he still came up with the ideas. He just when he saw them in action, he didn't think they worked. So it's like, eh. and that's why you have someone with you who can figure out how to make it work. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at her IMDb, <laughs> Penelope's. She's not even listed as a like. It's not one of her known for movies. That's weird, isn't it? It's like I would. That is like, weird. Oh, a dude like, overshadows a woman again. No. No, no. I mean, like the IMDb isn't picking it. Like no. they picked out Black Sheep. They picked out Little Rascals, but they didn't pick Wayne's Beverly World. Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> Oof. I think I saw that in theaters. <laughs> I did not. I don't think I've ever seen it. My whole family was a. Family it was funny. I show. enjoyed it. Yeah. Because uh, Ernest was the star, right? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I loved him. Brian did not go through an earnest phase like the rest of us. I liked the one where you played basketball, and that was it. <laughs> My favorite was it. No, Ernest I mean, goes to no, prison. I mean. <laughs> and then Ernest, Ernest P. Worrell. Stupid. Uh, okay. I loved all his uh, commercials. Maybe no, we they were do so a, good. A whole month on Ernest. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, yes. I'm in every episode. <laughs> yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Educate Brian on the joys of uh, Ernest. Uh, uh. <laughs> Like, maybe yes. this maybe just made in, my uh, maybe in October. Whatever <laughs> month we do it. <laughs> um, what else have we missed about this movie? Like, I feel like we've just kind of done a real scatter shot of things that we liked. But was there anything like um, major? Like, we haven't talked at all the, anything about Alice Cooper. The production design in this movie is really odd to me. <gasps> I mean, so? it's almost as comedic as everything else. 
because just the worlds that you're put into other than the movie the tv show set that one seemed pretty legit except i've never been in a studio that has a control room like that maybe for live tv it's different where you have a control room the one at the the show i used to work at i uh, had a <laughs> uh <laughs> Had a control booth that was similar to that, yeah. but it was a little, like, the... It made me think of an airport. Yeah, but we didn't have windows, but it was still, like, up and above. Like, you still had to go up into an attic that would look... That if there were windows, you would see the stage. Yeah. There just were no windows. Mm. But it was the same sort of thing at the show I used to work at. Um... And it's interesting looking at the guy who did this, because the production design was by Greg Fonseca? Fonseca? Uh, and he did Forever Young. Oh, uh, what a tearjerker, <laughs> that one. Mel Gibson stays young. Critters. <laughs> I love Critters. He Great movie. Love Cone Critters. Heads. Coneheads! Yeah. I'm sure he did a bad movie at some point in his career, right? <laughs> so far, he's three for three. <laughs> the last movie he did as a production designer was Wayne's World 2. Oop. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Slip a little bit, but... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh... But so there's just like different levels of like craziness. I don't understand Cassandra's bedroom. I don't know where she is. <laughs> I feel like she could almost be a squatter because you're not really given an idea of her location at all. Even no, it just looks like a lofted like warehouse floor. Like she was not given even a... a floor. You're in a corner. But that's you just where they see... are. So I assume her. That's what I mean. You only see that corner. She yeah. could be squatting somewhere. And she just dressed that one spot up real nice. I mean, I suppose that's possible, but I, I don't think that was the intention. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then you have the quote-unquote bachelor pad of Rob Lowe, which I find hideous. <laughs> oh, uh, my God. It, it, it looks like uh, Mindy St. Clair's house. Kind of. Yeah, right? <laughs> except not as ugly of pillows. Mindy St. Clair or Rob Lowe? Rob Lowe. <laughs> I mean, Rob Lowe, it definitely has that look of someone who's trying to be super 90s to the point of, you know, comedy. So it definitely captures the idea of it being a hyper-realized 90s movie. Like, they were really good at bringing in that super 90s that... Did anyone actually design their place like this <laughs> and the funny thing is like this is 1992 like this is like this is what's setting the tone for the 90s yeah. like this is because like the, the real tone of the decade doesn't kick in to like three or four years into it so this it is and it depends on which type of 90s you want because yeah. after this you had the grunge era and then which you started wayne and garth are kind of part of the like kind the, of part of it like garth they started it yeah they, they kind of had the baggy clothes the flannels like the yeah. the but cattle there, prod on your head that's not really shown in the design <laughs> Sure. Uh, and you don't get to see much of their house outside of... You get to see Garth's bedroom. Do we see Wayne's bedroom? I don't know if you see his bedroom, but you see his house. You, you see his collection of hairnets and name tags. Yeah, you, you see his kitchen briefly. Yeah. Why don't I remember that? <clears throat> That's when he's walking through the house and he's like, uh, I've never... I've had multiple Let me put jobs. it this way. Nothing I consider a career. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I have a multiple... I have a... What is it? Expansive collection of hairnets and name tags? Yeah. Apparently, I just didn't. Just zoned that. out. That did not absorb <laughs> into my brain, so I can't comment on the production design there. It looks like but, a house. Yeah. Like that's, I it, love the detail in Garth's room, though, with all the posters. Uh, and apparently, there were supposed to be stills in his room, I think, of some of their skits from SNL of yeah. him sitting on the mm -hmm. couch. And then, you know, the costumes on that dog was amazing. Oh my god, the the kind of wig sort of thing, yeah. so that his, the dog's hair matches Garth's hair. And I just love the fucking conversation with the dog. The what? What happened? To, oh, Wayne's outside. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to have gotten gotten a glimpse of their parents. I don't know. Like I, I, I can see what you mean, but at the same time, kind of keeping the parents in this like peanuts esque. That's right. I would have liked the Peanuts esque. Like, if we had seen, like, the back of their heads and we just hear the. <laughs> I think that would have been a really funny. That would have been pretty funny, yeah. Because <laughs> they both live with their parents. Right? I mean, just be glad that never got a third one, because then who knows what it would have been. Or, you know, maybe we'll just get a third one now and they'll have kids, because that apparently is the only thing 
any movie can come yeah. up with. And oh, the, they grew up. They have kids now. They're probably daughters if they're guys. Yeah, they'll probably be daughters yeah. because that makes it more progressive. Oh, my God. How many times do I have to watch that same fucking movie? Again? No, I'm not excited for Bill and Ted. Uh, I want to see it. I know a lot of people want to see it. I'm just like, I already watched Jay and Silent Bob. It's the I think same that movie needs thing. to face the music. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, <laughs> waka 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 waka. <laughs> uh, any other big things that we've missed in this movie? Uh, again, we I, didn't really talk about Alice Cooper. I guess we should talk about him just for a minute because this is when I think most of us realized that Alice Cooper was uh, was an act, and he's this kind yeah. of normal guy. He's a nice dad. <laughs> yeah, he's a good dad. He's a really good dad. We didn't know that then, but now we do. <laughs> Uh, that was one of the trivia things life. I liked about uh, this movie is that he's actually very knowledgeable and almost like kind of a historian for well, things. And well, that and apparently when they were pitching the movie to him, he's like, "So I just got to sing a song." All right, yeah, man, let's do it. Sounds great. And they show up like, "All right, here's your line." He's like, "I have a line, and it's this." <laughs> Not a line. That's a. Scene. It's a speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the man's a fucking professional. He memorized it on the day, recorded it great. Fucking one of the best scenes in the whole movie. It really is. <laughs> like, yeah. everything about the Alice Cooper concert, like, from going to Milwaukee, I almost just said Milwaukee, uh, going to Milwaukee, <laughs> doing the whole, um, oh, fuck, what's the name of the show that they're doing the intro for? Oh, Laverne and Shirley. Laverne Thank and you. Shirley. Thank you. God, okay. Um, like, and, and I lo- fucking love the way that it's played. Like, what a random fucking thing to put in this movie to begin with. Granted, there's tons of that throughout. <laughs> But just like, yeah, we're just going to recreate the entire opening act. And then you find out that it's not just like, oh, we're just watching a montage. No, we're watching them actually do this. Wayne and Garth are just having fun <laughs> in Milwaukee. <Yeah. laughs> and then like and midway I, through, like, oh, fuck, we have a concert to go to. <laughs> oh, I love to that. a lot of places really I, fast. The most unbelievable part of the movie was that they, you that you could have fun in Milwaukee. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean... I, I, I've brought this up in many a podcast, and I'll bring it up again. I used to have fun in Milwaukee because my dad bought season tickets to the Bucks just so we could see Michael Jordan. Um, I've that, only taken a bus through Milwaukee. I've never spent any time there. Uh, I spent about three hours there every so often when we would see a game, and then we'd immediately leave. <laughs> Poor Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> in three-hour chunks, it's perfect. It's great if um, you're there to watch a basketball game. <laughs> yeah. I love with this Laverne and Shirley segment that – as I was reading up on the movie, that it was the hardest one to bring about internationally as the movie went out in a wider release. They, they couldn't figure it out because the reference was just so weird and, and, you went, and American. And I kind of <laughs> liked that about the movie. That, that, that was so specific and so unapproachable elsewhere, but they kept it in, especially now where that would be scrubbed out. Oh, yeah. Like, like that, <clears throat> that and um, so many of his, like... Uh, like his random phrases, like when monkeys fly out of my butt, like that one I saw on IMDb was like changed to. Uh, this is the end of the world. Yeah, something just completely random, like just the way end Mike Myers. Days. Yeah, Mike Myers just talked in a way that made it tough to translate to other countries, which I find <laughs> kind of funny. Um, uh, the other thing in this movie that I think is pretty great before we we start wrapping this thing up is I, I love that you can just tell how good of friends Mike Myers and Dana Carvey actually are. Like, you can just see their their legit off-screen friendship just beautifully on screen. And you don't get to see it as much as you do as the scene, uh, the first scene when they're on the hood of their car, the hood of the Murph Mobile, as the, the plane flies over. So much of that scene is ad-lib- ad-libbed, and it's just, like, cut together. So, like... Uh, the a lot of people know this one but if you don't the line where garth asks wayne hey when you uh when bugs bunny used to dress up like a girl did you ever find him attractive that thing uh that was an ad-libbed line that they were just doing while they're waiting for a plane to go overhead like they just had nothing there and they're just like oh fuck it we're gonna keep rolling until the plane's gone and he just threw out that one line and earlier in that take uh earlier in a different take uh dana carvey had said something that made uh, Mike Myers completely break and lose character and you that huge laughter and when they're watching it in the edit they took like oh shit Garth had an amazing joke and Mike Myers had an amazing laugh so we're just gonna pair those together and now you have one of the funniest scenes in the movie <laughs> like, I, just, I love how that shit works out and then somebody watched it and went you're right Bugs Bunny is hot as a woman <laughs> and that person wrote Space, Space Jam, Jam. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, there's, I just, I, there, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. All right, so there's this uh, one or one scene I want to talk about real quick before you start wrapping up to uh, the product placement scene. 
Oh which my is, god, how do we forget about the product placement scene? <laughs> one of my f- that aside from the uh, Garth uh, destroying the robot hand and saying we fear change, which is also one of my favorite lines of the whole movie. But the product <laughs> placement and the like, oh my, I have a headache. Oh, take two of these. I know all those products and all those catchphrases because of that movie. It was Little, insane. Yeah, like still, different. yeah, and, and you know, it's the choice of a new generation. That was another joke that went sailing over my head as a kid. I'm like, why did, why did Garth change clothes? I don't understand. <laughs> like, it just did not make sense to me, at all. I just really appreciate how they're able to capture the correct lighting for those commercials. Oh yeah. To may really make you feel like you're watching the commercial for a moment. <laughs> oh yeah, even the uh, Great Poupon segment that they did. That was honestly when Brian's talking about quoting this movie. That's my quote. Like, I cannot <laughs> quote the entirety of this film. Like, yeah. I do enjoy this movie. I've always enjoyed it. But obviously, it impacted you guys more than it did me on a certain level. But Grey Poupon, whatever <laughs> it was about that, when I was a child, that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Had you seen the commercial it was referencing before yes. that? Okay. <laughs> I loved yeah, the yeah, commercial for, sure. for Grey Poupon. I just I know when I was a kid, this was my introduction to that joke. I'd never seen really? the commercial before this movie. Yeah, either did, did I. I think it was a running gag in my family for a while. Like I swear, oh we yeah, used to no, say same. That to each other when we were at the dinner table. Oh, I made my mom buy Grey Grey Poupon after this movie, and then she had me try it, and I'm like, oh, I don't like mustard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we no, would say that not, at the table. It's a fancy mustard. It's not normal mustard. It's still it's still mustard. Yeah, and I like it. Ugh. No <laughs> mustard, we're please. We're gonna order Grey Poupon next time we do an order. Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep. Nope. <laughs> yep. No great coupon. Like Denied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, I think that's pretty much everything we can say about this thing. I mean, at least in a reasonable amount of time. Like, we could sit here and quote the entire movie back and forth to each other. We can talk about how great the music was, how great the actors were. But, but we kind of already did that. I think the most interesting thing about this movie that is the stuff we've already talked about is how few SNL people are in it for an SNL movie. Yeah, it's not the never-ending cameo fest that Coneheads was. Or Blues Brothers. Yeah. I mean, Blues Brothers didn't have that many, but still more than this. Maybe they were all... Filming SNL? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, boy. Okay, so let's move into quotes, as in your favorite quotes from this movie. I... Let's see if everybody can have more than one, but let's let's see if we can let's see if we get them all in one. I believe in us. Anybody can go first if you have the one. I mean, Brock already kind of said his favorite one. What was yours again, Brock? Uh, we fear change. <laughs> we fear change. He smashed. Why well, he's the bashing shit. the fuck out of that? They don't explain it. It's you know they don't acknowledge it, and it makes it so great. That's supposed to be a reference to uh, Terminator Two again, I think. But honestly, it made me think of Frankenstein. Like Frankenstein's monster. We're talking about him bashing the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, can, I can see yeah, both yeah. of them. I'm not sure if it was supposed to be Terminator 2. I know it came... I mean, maybe. From what I understand, it was supposed to be him creating a robot to kill somebody or something. Uh, yeah, who knows? Either way, it's funny. Uh, mine, I also kind of mentioned earlier, and mine comes with a fun backstory, which I, I have to mention. Uh, so mine is the amazing line, perfectly stated by... Uh, by Wayne a gun rack I don't even own a gun let alone many guns which would necessitate an entire rack what am I going to do with a gun rack um it's hard for me to choose a specific thing in this movie other than Grape Pawn which we already talked about extensively uh but I really appreciate Stacy's character like we've just oh, discussed as yeah. well and I really liked it you know when she keeps getting hurt, but she's okay. Like, and I, she's like, okay. Like when, so I really like Garth's delivery of that when she hits the car. And I didn't mean to take up. your line. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's what I was working towards. So you just said it for me. And she's okay. <laughs> you know, Stacy's a winner. They just don't know it yet. Oh, Stacy's great. I love Stacy, but she's no. gonna go on to do some things. And she's Laura Flynn Boyle. She's gorgeous. Except they dress she, her down a lot in this except movie. Except she's but. going to. Be better than Laura Flynn Boyle and not cut up her face. Uh, who hasn't gone yet? Is this John? Uh, that'd be me. Cool. Uh, I'm going to go with, since there's so many lines that end up being my favorite, I'm going to go with one that really stood out to me this time and just really made me happy to experience the line. Uh, is when he uh, Garth knocks the pen off the table. And he's like, come on, come on down here. 
And he's like, you know, did you ever see that Twilight Zone episode where the guy signed a contract and cut out his tongue and the jar and it wouldn't die, it just grew and pulsated and gave birth to baby tongues? <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's kind of where my brain space is for asides. It's like it's, to get distracted, follow a path, and then just be like, "Yeah, that's what it is. It's cool." Oh, back to the back to what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. It's also not an episode of Twilight Zone. <laughs> right, right. No, and it's totally <laughs> fictional. Uh, since nobody said my my backup line, I I feel like if we don't mention, I'll be very upset because we never mentioned uh, uh, Benjamin's right hand guy. Although I think he's hysterical. Like we didn't really mention the crew either, but. The right hand guy, and then the guy from Oz. I always forget the actor's name. With it, I love you, man. I love you too. I love you, man. <laughs> just no, say, you don't even know. I love you. <laughs> just, just say thank you. Um, but the line when he's trying to talk, when Garth is trying to talk that guy down from being with Benjamin and working for Benjamin, Benjamin is nobody's friend. If Benjamin were an ice cream <laughs> flavor, he'd be pralines and dick. <laughs> it's just the way Dana Carvey delivers most things is hysterical this one kind of takes the cake for me like just the way he says pralines and dick it's just like oh that is the grossest flavor <laughs> i thought wayne said that no, no it's garth. garth it is garth yeah because that's at the tv station and then he takes the uh the uh flashlight and removes the batteries like he's garth. removing the bullets from a gun oh yeah <laughs> so oh, that was great <laughs> careful where you point it's okay <laughs> it's okay it's okay movie's great uh so time for a review system which brock i didn't give you a warning i hope you've been listening to movies uh episodes late and if you haven't i bet you'll be able to catch on pretty quick okay double features what movie would you watch with this one as a double feature ooh, ooh, ooh. can i go first oh yeah hot rod okay i, think I haven't that... seen hot rod in a while i think i saw oh. it like in theaters right when it came out and maybe once again it was a funny movie i just never went back to it i feel like it's very <laughs> similar and it's like very charming, very silly. We're having fun making a movie kind of way. And I think the comedy, I mean, it's SNL alum, so I think the comedy kind of flows together. Yeah, that one definitely works. Uh, John, what about you? What do you got? Uh, <clears throat> I would go with Tucker and Dale versus Evil. And it's purely on the connection of two uh, funny dudes who work well together and have good charisma. I love Alan Tudyuk and everything, everything he's in. I just absolutely love it. And their interactions in that movie, their humor, their brand of humor in that movie gives me, while it, doesn't, it can never quite reach Wayne's World Heights, gets close. And I think that movie would also be a great pivot from this. Absurd to absurd and gory. God, Tucker and Dale is one of the best movies ever made for the first two thirds and then a really great movie for the last third. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chewy, I, I see yours on your phone. That's why I know you have yeah, one. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. Clueless. That is a really good one. So, oh, yeah. Seriously. Yep. Garth and Cher would be friends. Garth would be her edgy but easily manipulated guy friend yeah. that she could use to take her to the edgy places and she would feel safe the whole time. Wait, do you mean Garth or Wayne? Either, honestly. I feel like Garth would be a little intimidated by her. But exactly. Yeah. Cher would like that. Oh, maybe, yeah. I could see that. Ugh. I think. I don't know. Maybe. Honestly. Because she know. enjoyed Breckenmeyer, but she didn't really want to hang out with Breckenmeyer. Cher would honestly, she'd just like Wayne and Garth. I think. I think. I think they'd be friends. They talk the same. I mean, it's just a very different version of the same person. These are the Midwest slackers. She was the L.A. slacker. Yeah. Although she's not really a slacker. She's not but a slacker, but, but it's she's that a 90s, Valley girl. Yeah. But they, they sound kind of like Valley girls. Yeah. This is Except they're edgy metalheads. I'll rephrase. This is a Midwest Gen Xer. That was a West Coast Gen Xer. <laughs> Still kind of works. I just, I think they're really, would be really good pairings. Yeah, no, I dig very, it. Both very 90s. Uh, in lots of music, fashion, and you know all about figuring yourself out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my pairing is gonna be more based on the the love of music that this movie has because this movie it doesn't really shine the light on it in the way that I would have expected it to based on like who Wayne wants to be and what he likes, but it does definitely still have a love for that era of music that like 1987 to like 1994 sort of rock sort of 
like indie rock, like that sort of transitional phase of music. Like this movie just loves it. So I'm going to go for a movie that also loves movies and is very dedicated to the period that it's in. Um, I'd make sure to watch the one I'm going to suggest first and then watch Wayne's world because the first one's kind of a bummer. Uh, I'm going to go with high fidelity. I feel like since oh. they both kind of do like the talk to the camera thing and it's, it's still sort of uh, talking to them as if you're a buddy and you're just kind of getting along with each other. But they're both still kind of aloof and in their own world. I, I feel like they go together pretty well. And they don't both have a moment where the dude's being incredibly toxic jealous. Yeah. I, I, I and think they that, get over it. Yeah, and they get over it. I, I think they would I think they'd fit together pretty one well. one thing we didn't t- touch on. Wayne turns into a complete dick for a moment in this movie. And then gets over it. He gets over it. Yeah. But Cassandra is totally right to be like, you get the fuck out of here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all know there's no film in this camera. <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to be a man? <laughs> I was actually referring to the moment when he starts accusing her of uh, Maybe he's poking you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that one's pretty when rough. Yeah, yeah. accusing Ugh. her of being a slut. I'm like, excuse me, Wayne. Yeah, no, no. Wayne has a has a bit of a dark moment, yeah. and he gets he does get over it though. He does better. It's like, could you be any more of an asshole? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he acknowledges that he was an asshole too, right? It's not like he just moves past it. That's He's, what I mean. He, he does acknowledges it. it. Yeah, I, I don't. And, it's been a long time since I've seen High Fidelity, but he acknowledges it near the end there too, right? Where he realizes he needs to let his ex girlfriend go, which kind of gets her back in a weird way. They don't really stick the landing in High Fidelity like I, I used to think they did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my best rewatch a few months ago when I rewatched it. Uh, I still think it's a really good movie. Oh, but, it's still fun. Yeah, it's but, Jack Black is like most charming sometimes. Well, I mean, it's Jack Black before he's really Jack Black. When he could still just be a side character, it's just like a one-note thing. We'll, we'll, we'll do a whole thing on High Fidelity later. I, I love it. We that should movie. do a John Cusack month. There's some crazy that'd be a, stuff. Whew, that'd be a roller coaster of a month. We could do one episode <laughs> on as a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a movie. <laughs> Kinda. Uh, all right, but before we ever get to John Cusack or any of those other things, we've got to end this episode. I uh, so I'm gonna say that's 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 we're done talking about Wayne's World. It's over. We did it. We okay. Wayne's World did. Uh, <laughs> oh, we should have done like three different endings. Ah, oh, oh, damn it. No, we oh. gotta go to bed. It's nine twenty-two. <laughs> you have to go to bed. I'm gonna stay up past nine twenty-two because I'm I'm not old yet. Oh, that hurt my back saying that. Anyhow, uh, I am less than a month away from being in my late thirties. Yowza. Yeah. Anyhow. I'm already asleep. (laughs) Next week, we have the final movie for SNL month. And it's going to be a good one. (laughs) Is it going to be a... Superstar! Superstar. I'm so excited to watch Superstar. I don't... Has any of us seen it? I haven't seen it. I I never saw it it, around when it came out because I think my mom was obsessed with that character from I SNL. I might have seen one so, of the sketches from SNL. The only person who's seen it on this episode is the person who won't be on the episode. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. This is perfect. I'm actually really excited to watch it. I, I don't know if it's going to be good or bad or whatever, but I love Molly Shannon and I think Will Ferrell's hilarious. So the worst case scenario, I'm probably still going to laugh a little bit. I used to have a theory that if a movie is a comedy, I will laugh at least one time no matter what movie it is. And yep. so far, I don't think a movie's proven me wrong on that. We'll see. I like to laugh. Uh, and then, oh my god, do we have news for you listeners? You excited? I bet you are. Month of September person since Chewy here his birthday is in September. We had to do a production designer. Yay! Yay! Yay. Uh, and we're going with Eve Stewart. Everyone knows who I'm talking about, right? Oh, because everyone knows production designers by name. <laughs> All production designers are household names, yeah. correctly. The closest most people get is like, you know, Tim Burton's production designer. You're like, do you know what his name is? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, no, I have, I have index cards of production designers <laughs> sitting at my computer every morning, and I just go through them. All 36 of them. Eve Stewart. Uh, <laughs> Stewart. I can spell. Can you? It's, I don't know. It's still you missing the E. Oh, my God. Ve Stewart. There she is. I'm not sure what movies we will be covering next month, but Eve Stewart is actually a very, very accomplished production designer. I know we were kind of joking earlier. 
and the name that you probably should know. She has done, uh, she did the Les Mis Rob movie. She did King's Speech, which I believe she won an Academy Award for. Uh, she did Vera Drake, which was very beautiful uh, production design. She, she just has a very long and impressive career. Uh, also has movies like Cats, which we'll absolutely be covering. Can we do um, Victor Frankenstein? I enjoyed that movie. Sure. I mean, well, probably. I don't know. We'll see. There's only four weeks. What about I so- Frankenstein? Oh, that's not, different. That that's different. It's not as uh, she didn't production design that. It's not also <laughs> not a. It's not really a movie. It, it's a. It's definitely a thing that it's happens. It's a movie. It has a beginning, middle, and end. That's all it takes, right? It keeps getting Does recommended it, to me on Hulu. Does, it shouldn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm not sure which movies we'll be covering for her other than Cats. I was so excited when I saw because I looked her up based on. I'm like, I wonder who did the production design for King's Speech because they're amazing. And I don't like that movie at all. But the production design was amazing. So I looked her up. I'm like, she also did Cats? This is the best month ever. So, so excited for September where we'll be covering some of those movies. Let's do a round of plugs and then we can say goodbye. For me, check out every Monday. Uh, welcome to You Are Doom, the new Frisky Dingo podcast. We are chugging steadily along. And then I very, after doing a few episodes, I looked at a calendar. I'm like, wow, this show is not going to be around for very long. There's very few episodes of Frisky Dingo. And when we record two at a time, it kind of shortens that even more. Uh, but it's been fun so far. Please yeah. check it out. We're having a great time. you got to catch it while it's still going. Uh, and then every other show we have at ATHpod, ATHpod.com. Chewy, what you plugging? Superstore. Superstore. Super, super, superstore. John, what you plugging? Demon Days, the actual play podcast we do. Uh, Going to release that up, get that episode all scheduled tonight, and uh, you'll probably have heard it by now. Oh, and it was fun and amazing. I had so much fun with the intros this week. I got to do a uh, an audio <laughs> gag, which I've been wanting to figure out a way to do in the intros for your show from like the beginning. And then you oh, finally nice. wrote me in like a moment to do it. I'm like, <laughs> yes! <laughs> if you haven't listened uh, to them yet, you'll you'll get it when you get to the outro. Um, yes. Brock, what about you? What you plugging? Uh, Damage Boost Podcast. And for the last two weeks of August, I believe I have two brand new guests that have never been on the show before so that's exciting very exciting i look forward to listening to those that's everybody right we did it we did it we're done we did it we did it we're done so i can say bye bye See you later, bozos.